Okay, let's get our Bibles and turn to John chapter 15 and let's see what we can uh, uh, learn from this and grow from this today. There are some handouts on that back table. Uh, if you did not pick up one as you were coming in, you might want one to help follow along as we go through this chapter this morning. And uh, what I want us to do is just look at, just briefly, at some of these vital truths and concepts that you have uh, listed there on the first part of your handout, and then we'll get in and look at uh, the theme that runs through this short chapter. Several things that we can see here, uh, but one of, one of our favorite verses in chapter 15 ought to be verse 5, uh, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. It is not possible for us as Christians to bear any fruit or to be of any use to the Lord without Him. We can't even survive spiritually without Him. So one of the great uh, concepts and truths we see in this chapter is right there in verse 5, that without Jesus, we can do absolutely nothing. Another thing we see in this chapter is that falling away, um, losing our salvation... Being a Christian, being a child of God, and falling away from Him and being eternally condemned is taught very vividly in this chapter. Look in verse 2, chapter 15, verse 2. The Bible says, every branch, look, look at this verse, every branch. Jesus says in verse 1, I am the vine, uh, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. So get, get, the, uh, get this imagery of the allegory he's using here. That there, Jesus is the vine. His father is the owner. He's the vine dresser, the husbandman. I'm trying to think of what other words are used in those translations. Uh, of the gardener, I think, is used in one translation. That's, that's what God is. Jesus is the vine. Look in verse, uh, look in verse 5 again. I am the vine. And what, what are Christians? Branches. We're the branches. We, we, you are an individual branch. This is not talking about, as uh, some have mistakenly said, that the branch, each branch represents a different church. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, you are the branches. Each and every one of us is a branch on the vine of Jesus Christ. Every Christian is a branch on the vine of Jesus Christ. Come back to verse 2. Every branch... What's the word you have after the word branch? Every branch in me. Where are Christians? Where are these branches? They're in Christ. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. I wonder what the purpose is of us being a Christian. I wonder what God's desire is for us as Christians to bear fruit. Well, what if I don't bear fruit? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, what does he do? He takes it away. If I'm in him and then he takes me away, guess where I'm no longer? Not in him anymore. If I don't bear fruit, God takes me away from the vine. God severs me if I am not a faithful Christian. Come down to verse 6. And verse 6 is even more graphic. If anyone does not abide in me, so, sometime, sometime maybe this afternoon, go through the first, uh, you don't have to even read the whole chapter, go through the first 11 or 12 verses and look at how many times the word in, I-N, is found in these verses to indicate and to emphasize the relationship that we're to have with Christ. We are to be in Him. Now, verse 6 says, If anyone does not abide in me, Here's a Christian. Here's a branch. But he chooses not to bear fruit. He chooses not to abide in Christ. He chooses not to abide in His Word. What happens to him in verse 6? He's not just taken away. Verse 2 says he's taken away. Verse 6 says he's cast out. I want you to think, of, I want you to think about, um, you know, when I, was, uh, uh, when I was a kid, we had... Uh, we had Small piece of property, acre, acre and a half, it's a lot bigger than what I have now. But uh, growing up, it seemed huge because my father and I always were in charge of cleaning the acre and a half. And as a kid, it seemed like 40 acres, you know, and it wasn't that much. But on an acre and a half, we had somewhere around 400 or 500 trees. 
Maybe it was four or 5,000, but it, it was probably only about 40 or 50, but it seemed, you know. And so if you have all of those trees, guess what all of those trees have? Branches. And what do you got to do with all of those branches? You got to trim them. And then what do you got to do with the branches once they're trimmed or once they fall off? Then you got to haul them off. So, you know, a lot of work here. We'd trim the trees. And then we would take away those branches, the word in verse 2. We'd take them and we would cast them, at least off of the good part of the property, and we'd cast them onto the, the fire pit. Look in verse 6. Every branch that does not abide in me is cast out as a branch and is withered. They gather them up. Imagine going around the property and gathering all of the branches. Then they're thrown. Where are they thrown in verse 6? Into the fire and they're burned up. Now why did you and why did I and why do you, maybe still present tense, have a yard where you go and you gather all of these limbs and all of these branches and you take them. And if you're still allowed, are you still allowed today to burn on your property? I don't even know if that's allowed uh, by law anymore. But we did. Man, we had big old bonfires throwing all those palm fronds on. Imagine you, why are you throwing those into the fire and burning them up? To get rid of them. What? They're branches. Why do you want to get rid of them? They're useless. If those palm fronds have been laying on the ground for uh, two or three months, what good are they doing to you? Fertilizer. Okay. Are they alive? No, they're dead. Is it possible that even a, a branch on the tree, still connected to the tree, could be dead? The imagery that Jesus is using here about us and about the church. He's the vine, we are the branches. Just because we might be connected and still on the tree in that sense, guess what? We could be dead. And if we're, if we're a dead branch, what good are we? Why do you go along and you, why do you go along, if there's a dead branch on a tree, why don't you just leave it alone? Why do you go along and try to trim those dead branches off of the tree? You see, these, you see these palm trees that have the nice green palms at the top, but then the brown ones are hanging down. Why, why do you go trim? Just leave them alone. Why do you trim them off? Give me some reasons. It might have, could those branches affect the other ones? Why do you trim them off? They look ugly. Do those ugly branches, are they making that whole tree look bad? Are they making the other branches look bad? Let's get rid of them. Dirk? It's for the health of the tree. We understand this when it comes to our trees and our bushes, and that's why Jesus used this imagery. They understood it too. It is possible for us to fall away from Christ. And when we fall away, what's going to be the end result? We're going to be cast into the fire. Well, we, we, if we have time, we'll try to look at that again as we go through the chapter. Another thing we see in this chapter is the perfect example that Jesus left for us in so many cases. You know, sometimes it's the little words. It's the little words in these chapters that we, that we, don't, uh, that we don't pay attention to. But here's another little word, two letters, as... Um, Let's start in verse 9. I think I only have verses 10 and 12 on the screen. But let's start in verse 9 because this is the first time you see the word as. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. How much does Jesus love you? According to this verse, using the word as. The, the word as is, is, a, is an adverb that gives us a measurement. It, it gives us a degree. It, it, it gives us... Uh, how, how far is this going to go? How much, according to this verse, does Jesus love you? As much as the Father loved him. How much does the Father love Jesus? Can, 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 we, even, can we even put that into words? Can we, even, can we even conceive of how much the Father loves the Son? 
Can you conceive of any greater love than what the Father has for the Son? It doesn't get any greater than that. Jesus says in verse 9, As much as He loves me, I love you. That's how much Jesus loves you. Look in verse 10. See the word as again. If you keep my commandments. By the way, that word if is another little word that you need to go through this chapter and circle when you find it. Conditional word. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. What are we commanded to do in the first part of verse 10? Keep His commandments. And the only way we can abide in His love is to keep His commandments. Do we have any measuring rod? Do we have any standard? Do we have any degree by which we are to set ourselves in keeping the commandments of Christ? What does the word as say? As Jesus kept His Father's commandments. How much did Jesus keep His Father's commandments? How far did He go? He, he obeyed them all the way. As much as Jesus obeyed the Father, guess what we need to do? We need to obey the Son in order that we might abide in His love. Third time, down in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as... Here's our model, here's our measure, here's our uh, motivation. As I have loved you. How much are we supposed to love one another? What's our measure and model in this? As much as Jesus has loved you. Is that hard sometimes? I mean, how much did Jesus love you? That's verse 12, what does verse 13 say? Greater love has no man than this. And lay down his life for his friends. We know how much Jesus loved us. He tells us in verse 12, that's the standard, the measuring, the measurement by which we're to gauge how much we love each other. Are we, uh, are we pretty petty sometimes in our relationships with each other? Do we have higher expectations of our brethren than we might even have for ourselves? I want you to think about the love of Jesus. And it was in, uh, it was in the last chapter that we looked at the fact that Jesus' love, I think it actually was in chapter 13. Does Je did Jesus stop his love based upon who was deserving of it and who was not? Did, did he... Did he did he measure out, well, this person's more deserving of my love, so I'm going to give them more love than I'm going to give to this person. Did Jesus do that? I hope, he, I hope he didn't do that or we're in trouble. Jesus had a love that was not based upon who was deserving of it, because who is deserving of the love of Christ? Not a single solitary soul. Who's deserving of our love? Jesus says, here's my commandment, that you love one another. How much, Jesus, am I supposed to love one another? As I have loved you. One other, one other vital truth and concept we see here, and that's in verse 13. What an idea. Greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did. In those previous chapters, Jesus says, uh, back in, uh, uh, he, he says, I've got the power to lay it down and I've got the power to take it back. In chapter 10, he, that's what he said. He said, I, I, I'm going to lay down my life. He talked about the good shepherd and how the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. For a lowly, stinking sheep, a shepherd would lay down his life. You know, this says that Jesus laid down his life for his friends, but you know Romans chapter 5, don't you? Romans chapter 5 doesn't use the word friends when it talks about Jesus laying down his life. Finish this verse. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet, mm, Christ died for us. While we were yet his best friends, while we were yet sinners. When you read Romans chapter 5, you read the even verses, verse 6. Verse 8 and verse 10. And you're going to three, find three words for those who Jesus died for. Verse 6, 8, and 10. 
He died for the ungodly. He died for sinners. And he died for his enemies. You know what? Go over to Romans 5 just for a second. Look in, cha- look in verse 7. Because this ties right into to John 15, 13. Romans chapter 5, should, I think it's verse 7. Verse 6 says, while you're turning, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Here's verse 7, what I want us to see in connection with John 15, 13. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Greater love is no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. It's one thing to lay down your life for your friends, isn't it? It's one thing, is what Paul is saying in verse 7, it's one thing for somebody to lay down his life for a righteous man. Um, how many righteous men did Jesus lay down his life for? Can you count them? Can, can, you, name, can you name a righteous person for which Jesus died? There wasn't one. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man some will even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, that's who he died for. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We didn't deserve Jesus to die for us. He sacrificed himself. He paid the price. He, he took upon himself the penalty that was due unto us. And that's one of the great truths, concepts that we see in John 15. All right, let's look at this theme just briefly. Uh, there's a lot here, although there's only 27 verses. There's a lot in this chapter. But if you want to boil it down into one common theme throughout the chapter, it's the, it's the idea of abiding in Christ. And, uh, and Jesus teaches us what's involved in that in John chapter 15. Uh, here, here's a, we might call it a parable uh, or an allegory or a figurative language or something. But you have this whole discussion in the first part of the chapter where Jesus says, I'm the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. And then he goes into this discussion uh, about the vineyard and about the individual disciples. We said this earlier, that they are the individual branches. And verse 4 says that if we're apart from Christ, we cannot, we, we cannot bear any fruit. Look at verse 4. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Um, what good is a branch of a tree without the tree. How much fruit are you going to get from the branch of a fruit tree without the tree? Uh, It's almost a ridiculous question, isn't it? You know, it's obvious. You're not going to get anything. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You know, sometimes... Sometimes I think we look at being a Christian and we think about what what I am doing and what I am going to get from what I am doing and what impact my actions are going to have on on someone else. And and I think sometimes we look at it as a Christian. Unfortunately, I think we look at ourselves too much as the branch and not often enough seeing us tied to the, to the vine. And I don't know if I'm making sense with this. I'm trying to, trying to develop a, uh, an imagery here. Sometimes as a Christian, I think we try to live our lives separate from the vine. Not necessarily saying that we're trying to, to go out into the world and live amid, uh, amidst the world. But, but when we say, we say it often. We say, may God receive the glory and the honor through what I'm doing. What does that mean? It means it's not about me. It means that whatever fruit, whatever fruit comes from my efforts as a Christian, it's not about me. It's not for me. 
and it's not because of me. Can, can, God, take, can God take the weakest of people and use them for His cause? Can God take someone, if you look at two people, one who has great faith because he's spent his whole life studying the Bible and one who's a new Christian, a new convert, and his faith is not all that great because he just doesn't have the knowledge of this. Can God use this new convert to do great things? How can he do that? Because it's not about the person. It's about what that person can do with Christ through Christ, and for Christ. And so we see in this allegory, in this parable, uh, that the branch uh, cannot do anything if it's separated from the vine. And there the, here's this emphasis throughout this chapter. I'm going to throw these up real quick, because uh, this is just some of the... Uh, you're going to find in this chapter, what is it, 12 times, I think, in this chapter you see the word abide. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a key word uh, in this chapter. And what it means is that we are to remain, we are to dwell, we are to stay within Christ. The word itself emphasizes the fact that apostasy is possible. I mean, what? Why would, why would Jesus emphasize a dozen times in this chapter, why would he tell us so often to abide in him if it really didn't matter? Dirk? Say that again. Yeah. Too, too, Dirk says, too many times we try to become the vine when we should just be the branch. Um, and that, and that's uh, there's a lot of truth in that, that uh, we, we need to allow Christ to have all authority. We need to, be, we need to allow Christ to be the Lord. We need to allow Christ to be the master. We need to allow Christ to be the vine and the one in charge, and allow ourselves uh, to grow from Him. But as you go through this chapter, and you, and you focus on this word abide, you'll see that abiding in Christ is not just a take it or leave it kind of thing. If I want to please God, I have to abide in Him, and that's why it's commanded in this chapter. Abiding in Christ is not something that just automatically continues once you become a Christian. Well, I was baptized and I became a Christian, so that means I am abiding in Christ. Well, not automatically. You know, it, it's, it's something that takes effort. And that's why the present tense is used half a dozen times here to say this takes continuous activity and takes continuous work. Trina? Sometimes I think we forget that it's a living relationship. That every day is a relationship. Every day is a relationship with Christ. Every day is a relationship with God. And that every day is a Right. Tr Trina says it's a, it's a living relationship. Relationships take work, don't they? Ever been married? A anybody in here ever been married? Uh, do, do relationships take work? Um, what happens if your marriage is no longer a, to use Trina's terminology, what, what happens if your marriage is no longer a living relationship? What's the opposite of that? You're not doing so good, are you? Your relationship with the Lord, it takes effort. And Trina says it takes effort every day. And she says sometimes, some days are better than others. Is that the way it is in your marriage too? Are there some days that are better than others? Um, when you have bad days in your marriage, don't, don't answer this out loud, especially if you're sitting next to your mate. If you have bad days in your marriage, is it possible that any of those bad days, remember, don't answer this out loud, okay? This is just in your head. Is it possible that any of those bad days could be your fault? Shh, don't just think the answer. Is it possible that any of those bad days might be your fault? I know that most of them are the other person's fault, okay? But this is just the honest reflection in your own mind. When we have tough days being a Christian, is it God's fault? The Lord's fault? You know, it, we, we, are, we are an imperfect people trying to please a perfect God. 
and we stumble. Does God expect us to be perfect? Is He looking for perfection? Well, if He's not looking for perfection, then maybe I should stop trying to be perfect. Maybe I should stop trying to get everything right. If He doesn't care if I'm doing everything right, then I don't need to do everything right. Well, that's kind of a messed up idea, isn't it? You know, Jesus says to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. I've got to abide in Him. I've got to do all I can to stay within Him. Share it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Second John verse 9. This word abide, this word abide is, is used frequently in, in the writings of John. And, and Sherrick mentions Second John in verse 9. Where it says, He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. He who does what? He who abides with... How do we abide in Christ? We, we've got to get in His Word. And, and that's, that's, that's the how of, of, of what we do. There's only one way for us to abide in Christ. Uh, there's, not, there's not multiple choice. There's not multiple directions and avenues by which we can abide in Him. Jesus gives two concepts here. Two vital keys to abide in Him. And the first one is exactly what Sherrick was mentioning from 2 John verse 9. If we're going to abide in Christ, we must abide in His words. Look in verse 7. Look at what Jesus, look at what Jesus says in verse, well, you know what, back up. Look in verse 4. The command in verse 4 is, abide in me. That's not optional. I've got to do that. Abide in me and I in you. Sometimes we read abide in me and I in you and we think that's like a, a, a command and then a result. A command and then, and then something that follows. If I abide in him, then, then he will abide in me. But that's not what Jesus, Jesus is not saying that one is a command to be followed and the other one is a result of it. Both of these are commands. Abide in me and see to it that I abide in you. How can I see to it that Jesus abides in me? Look in verse, uh, uh, well, let's see, what was that? Verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words... Abide in you. What's the difference between how verse 7 starts and how verse 4 starts? Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. How do we ensure that Christ is abiding in us? There's only one way to do it. John? It, uh, it, it's, it's, as John talks about those, those early chapters of the book of Revelation when Jesus wrote to those congregations, uh, the seven uh, congregations in Asia, uh, 
And many of them, most of them had problems and issues that they were dealing with to the point uh, that, uh, that several of them had left Christ. And, and uh, the, the fact is that the head, as John says, Jesus is the head of the church. Anything wrong with the head? No. Uh, it's the body that has problems sometimes. Um, well, what's the church, what is the body made up of? You're looking at it. It's us. It's made up of a bunch of imperfect people. It's made up of women who could probably do pretty good, and then it throws the men in there too. We got men and women in the church. Do men and women always get along just right? Uh, that's another one, just think in your head and not say it out loud kind of things. Do we have imperfections and problems? Yeah, but it comes back to this, to this idea when we allow ourselves to become more important than the head, when we allow ourselves to feel like our needs and our desires supersede those of the head, then we're going to have problems. We're going to have issues. And our responsibility as Christians is individually to strive to abide in Christ. The responsibility of elders, of shepherds, is to strive to make sure that the congregation as a whole and individually is abiding in Christ. Wes? There's, there's so many facets to this concept of abide, and that's what uh, uh, Wes is talking about. We, we've got to make up our minds. That's what we're going to do. And then we've got to follow through, and we've got to do it. There are two, two vital keys here to abiding in Christ. We've got to abide in His words, and we've got to let His words abide in us. If that's not happening, then we're not abiding in Christ, and He's not abiding in us. The second key that's given in this chapter is that we've got to abide in His love. Uh, up earlier on your, on your sheet and on the screen, we had that there are two commands, two imperatives in this chapter, where he says, abide in me, that's one. And then the second time you find the command is where he says, abide in my love. We cannot abide in Christ if we don't abide in his love. We can't abide in his love if we don't abide in Christ. What does it mean to abide in his love? How, how do I go about abiding in his love? What, what's the, uh, somebody said something. Emulate his, love. E emulate his love, and that's it exactly. Jesus said, remember what we saw uh, in verse 12, as I have loved you, that's how much you're to love one another. If I'm going to abide in his love, I've got to love, I've got to strive to love like he loved. The word love that's used throughout this chapter is that Greek word agape love, which means what? It's unconditional and it's unselfish. It's not about me. It's all about the person that I'm striving to, to make better and striving to encourage and to build up the recipient of that love. In order to uh, uh, abide in Christ, there are responsibilities that I have, and I, I want to uh, get through a couple of these. What do I have, about three minutes? Ha! Huh, about a minute. It was close. Oh, he's going to give me two. All right. Abiding in Christ, we've got responsibilities. One of those responsibilities that's emphasized throughout this chapter, and, the, and we'll talk about this for a couple minutes and then finish, is bearing fruit. What does that mean to you? What, what does it mean to you that as a Christian you are to bear fruit? Say it again. Okay, we've got to teach others. We've got to teach others. How do you bear fruit as a Christian? What does that mean? Does, does that not indicate that a life of inactivity is not acceptable? If I'm inactive, 
in serving God. I'm not bearing fruit. How how pleasing is it to God if we don't bear fruit? Go back and read verse 2 and verse 6 that we read at the beginning of class. It's pretty serious. Uh, if, if uh, If we're not bearing fruit, that's one of the great responsibilities that the Lord has given to us. It's the very purpose for which Jesus said He chose His apostles. I chose you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should not just happen one time, but it should, present tense, remain. And this, as, as John and Trina and so many have said this morning, this has got to be a part of every part of our life. Our life needs to be uh, concerned with the idea of bearing fruit in this chapter, not about some fruit. Three times you've got the word more, much, and much. That's got to be our aim, not just to bear some fruit, but to bear much fruit. Trina? Yes. So that's the fruit. Yes. When when you when you abide in Christ, then then His Word abides in you. Does His Word have transforming power? Yes. That's what Romans chapter twelve one and two and Second Corinthians chapter three verse eighteen says. That when I look into that into that perfect law of liberty, when I look into it, I can reflect back, and if I allow it, it can transform and change my life. If it truly transform and change my life. What am I going to do? It's going to affect what I do from that day forward. It, by, by, by the very fact that it is, His Word is dwelling within me, will help me to bear fruit. One more point on verse 8. What's the whole purpose of bearing fruit? Is it for us? By this, my Father is glorified. The fruit is not about us. It's about glorifying God. May God help us to read chapter 15 and to learn how to even more abide in Him. All right, we'll take a break for about 15 minutes and we'll start worship about 10 o'clock.